Pastor Stephen Curry was raised in Bethlehem. There, he and his father created Holy Land Missions, a ministry that has flourished for over 36 years. They chose to stay and preach the gospel in a time when others chose to flee. Jim Dow, the president of Voice of the Martyrs, said Stephen Curry has a fearless determination to share the gospel anywhere, without reservation. Pastor Stephen has continued to minister in the West Bank. He frequently appears on TV to tell his story of how an Arab can share the love of Jesus. God has given Pastor Stephen the assignment of encouraging Christians around the world to be bold and courageous. Shalom and Salam. Dear Pastor Dr. Wilson, Pastor Steve, Israel Director Patrick Chadrick, and Grace Leadership and Grace Family, thank you for your love and your diligence to the Lord in ensuring the gospel is being planted around the world. Your love and generosity to Christ is inspiring. Calvary Jerusalem Ministries, please remember this name. I will ask the Lord to engrave it on your heart by the end of this message. I want to ask you to open your heart and to join me to see what I see in the world, to see others through the eyes of God. I'd like to invite you into our lives to hear some of the experience we've had to experience, which made us fall in love with Jesus even deeper. Let's go on a journey together today. I ask the Lord today to give you a new passion and a new burning desire to stand up and to be unfazed in your daily walk and in daily life. I ask that you'll never be the same after this encouraging message, which you'll, which you'll hear. I want to tell you about myself. I am a Pastor Stephen Curry. I was born in the city of Jerusalem. And I grew up in the birth city of Jesus Christ, the city of Bethlehem. I grew up in a home of, of a pastor, an evangelist. Uh, my father started the Bethlehem ministry here over 42 years ago. So we have the years of of credibility um, and years of, of going through the storms in, in the Holy Land to take in a stand for the kingdom and take in a stand for Christ. What's exciting about all this is that I'm able to minister and to walk in the same cities and towns and villages and streets that Jesus Christ our Lord walked in, ministered in, and was able to touch people's lives and to heal people and to encourage people's lives. Now, my childhood wasn't the most normal one. In school, I was called son of a Christalizer, son of an evangelist, uh, son of a Jew lover. So that's the kind of childhood I had growing up. In church, our Sundays, we'd be sitting in service, worshiping and praying and spending time with the Lord. And we'd have Molotov bombs uh, inside our church. Fires would be lit up over the sanctuary. During the during those days, you'd come into our church, you'd see a water, you see buckets of water in front of the church, and we get up and turn, get the buckets of water. We turn off the water and, and we turn off the fire, and then and move on and worship and pray like nothing happened. That was an average Sunday for us during those days. There'd be Sundays where church members walk out the church doors and there'd be rocks and, 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 and stones coming at people's heads during a church service. And that was an average Sunday for us for many, 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 many days during those times. I remember uh, growing up seeing my father being physically beaten or attacked simply because he preached a sermon that went against other people's uh, philosophy or, or, or belief systems. I remember going to church or, or seeing my father being attacked or being seeing my father called names uh, simply because he said that Jesus Christ is the salvation for mankind. Now, those things, they leave a mark on a human being. They, 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 they imprint and implant something on your heart. And that is what I grew up seeing and understanding. My heroes were people in the Bible, disciples and apostles, and, and my modern day heroes were people like my father and others who lost their life or who were persecuted for the gospel. So that instilled within me the desire to love the Lord. Early on in my life, I had a desire to say, it's either I can change the world from, a, from the business corporate world or as young age, um, a, or the other option is to be able to change the world by preaching the kingdom and being the light and the, and the hands and the feet. Uh, and the servant of Christ to the communities that know no Jesus. So what I decided to do is early on is, is I decided to follow the steps of my father and to be able to preach and teach the gospel message and bringing hope to people. I remember a young, at a young age, a young man came to me who came from a, a, a different background or a different religious background. And I spent two weeks 
spending time with him, discipling him and teaching him the Bible. And after two weeks, he disappeared. And well, he disappeared uh, because he, his mother found his Bible under his bed. She gave it to his uncles. He woke up and his uncles were standing right above him. And they had, uh, they had metal hangers. And they began to beat him over and over and over again. And his, their beating was because of him studying the Bible, learning the Bible. And I remember when I heard about the story, I began to pray for him. I began to weep for him. Because this is a young man. His only, his only crime was fall in love with Jesus. And remember, they kept telling him to deny his love for Jesus, deny his love for Jesus. And he kept telling him, give me something to equally replace the joy that I have in Christ. And he told me, if you give me something to replace Jesus, I'll, I'll give him up. But until that moment happens, don't expect me to give up. The only thing that's given me joy, give me hope. And boy, this, this, his story, even though this short time was such an inspiration. You see, when that was happening, I was still going on ministering. And shortly after that, I was walking down the church street towards our church in Bethlehem. That's where the church I grew up in. That's where I was uh, trained in and sent out to the all of Israel today. I was walking towards the church, and as I was walking towards the church, somebody comes up to me and says, are you Stephen? I said, yes, I'm Stephen. I tell people, I felt something burning in the back of my head, and I flinched the back of my head like this, thinking it's a bug or a fly, and there was blood on my hand. And I turned around, there's about five or six guys there with metal chains and thick wooden sticks in their hands, and they began to beat me over and over and over again, calling me names like infidel and proselyzer and, and, and a Jesus lover, and, and in the middle colossal of this beating, I remember I shouted, I said, Lord, get me through this beating. I love you. I'll do more for you. Just get me out of it. It was painful being beaten over and over and over again with metal chains and thick wooden sticks. It was painful. I remember when I said that prayer, I, I, I tell people I literally felt like a white blanket just drape over my body. And at that moment, I understood what, the, what it means that we have a covenant God. We have a God that says what he means and he means what he says. We have a God that when he says, I will never leave you, no will I forsake you ever and ever and ever. That's the kind of God we have. Because in the middle of that beating, the presence of God was there. When I said that prayer, all pain was gone and all, all, it, it, the, the, I was conscious, but the pain and the fear was gone. However long that beating was, 30, 40, 50 seconds, it was painful right before that moment. But that beating was intended to shut me down, to scare me from talking about Jesus. That's what the intention of that beating was. To unfaze me from Christ. But it backfired. What that beating did, because I called on the Lord and He showed up in the middle of my beating. In the middle of the pain, He became my first aid. In the middle of that loneliness, He became everything I am. Because of that experience, they, this beating and these people who did what they did to me drew me closer to love God like never before. They drew me to have a deeper relationship with Jesus like never before. They picked me up, put me in this big, big dumpster, and they spray paint this dumpster. Look at this believer. Let him be, let, look at this evangelist. Let him be an example. What they're trying to say is anybody that does what I do, shares the gospel, evangelizes, disciples or trains, the outcome is, is this bleeding and so forth. I am who I am today, I tell people, because of the beating. There's no doubt about it. I am who I am today because of the beating. I remember uh, a, the inspiration I got for one, a, one very interesting story. There are, there are many religions in Israel. And one specific religion, uh, they pray over loudspeakers. And I remember my father, during our service, his sermons, we couldn't, it's hard to hear, the, it's hard to hear each other inside the church sanctuary. So I remember uh, my father one day um, putting a sermon up on speakers and uh, on top of the steeple of the church and the speaker sounds went all over the community and almost, almost every other Sunday for almost 25 plus years today, we have our preacher sermons on loudspeakers on top of the steeple so others can hear. And actually, those who are different than us or different religions than us, they actually come up to us and they actually say, we respect you because you are not ashamed of the gospel and you are not ashamed of your Christianity. They, might not, they don't agree with our faith, but they respect the fact that we are willing to, to risk everything and we are willing to be unfazed and we are willing to, to not be deterred from a relationship with Jesus and we're willing to be bold enough to stand up for our faith. Regardless what happens, we keep moving forward unfazed regardless. I'd like to start 
today by linking my life story with a scripture story. And, and here's what I'd like to, I'd like to start off saying, making a difference always comes at a price. Here are some of the most common prices that making a difference comes at. Making a difference most times comes at your own health, security and safety, at wealth, careers, at pride. Um, and it also comes at the cost of your past and your present and your future. Now, these might all sound like awful negative things. But as you heard from my childhood and experiences, it always works out. In all truth, all that I mentioned about are actually all great things when looked at with the correct lens, especially when you can see the long-term positive effect that suffering or persecution or, or paying a price for your faith, what it has long-term effect on you. See, here's what I tell people. Persecution, suffering, being unfazed or making the decision to stand bold in your faith, loving others regardless, it builds you character and it strengthens your faith. All of these I mentioned in my story and the above are experiences that make you stronger. Of course, once you make the decision to make a difference because the reward is eternal. Don't forget, making spiritual changes and taking steps to living for Jesus, it inspires others and it builds those closest to you. Unfaced faith changes this present and the future as you know it. What I want to do is link Acts 10 right now with my personal life story and to also make it applicable to your life story as well. And it's a story of a man named Cornelius. And it's a very neat story because Cornelius was a man who was very wealthy, had a high rank in the military. He was, he was a, he was a ruler, sort of something like a mix of a governor and a general. So he was a man that people went to for wealth, for wisdom, for military advice and so forth. Bible says that a man clothed in white, he appears, shining clothes, appears to Cornelius. And he tells him that Cornelius, your alms and your giving and your tithes and your prayers have been heard and seen before the Lord. And we see in the summary of the story that in the first around eight or nine verses in chapter 10, we see that, the, that Cornelius uh, looks at this angel and he's in shock and is in awe. And he tells them, all the, all the angel tells them right after tells them about your alms and the giving. He says, send your two, send your, send your men to fetch a man and to find a man named Peter. He's in Joppa and he'll be waiting for you because I will tell him you're coming. And, and I tell people this is a, an emotional story that it, it's embodies culture and tradition and Bible uh, teachings sort of in a colossal and somewhat clashing with, with each other. We see a beautiful and emotional story between Cornelius and Peter. Peter is in Joppa. He's right on the, on the other end and lower, lower part end of Caesarea. Now, on the other side of area called Joppa near the water, we see Peter. Peter is tired. He's exhausted, exhausted from ministering and traveling. And Peter Bible says he comes in. He's at the rooftop. He's sleeping. He's tired. He goes into a trance. In fact, I want to quickly read verses 9 to 14 with you. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up onto the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat and something, uh, something to drink. The Bible says that he went into deep sleep in a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth. And it was stretched from its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter's response, no, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. The rest tells us three different times this happens to Peter. He refuses to eat, and he refuses to submit to the Lord. The backdrop is that Peter had no desire to share the faith with non-Jews. In fact, in most of the early church founders, their vision was a salvation of the Jews and the Jews only. 
We see explicitly in chapter 11, the beauty about this, that Peter here is a lot like many believers today uh, in the body of Christ. It could be you, it could be any of us watching today or, or even speaking this. We fight and fight. And many times we wrestle with the Lord. And many times we refuse to give in to the will of God because a lot of times it just doesn't make sense in our physical or carnal or mental knowledge or, or wisdom. It doesn't make sense, but God is pushing us towards something. We want to do things our way because we have an agenda. See, we have our plans and we have our vision and we want to do them. And that's that's how we were, we were built is to have our own vision and to have our own, uh, we cast our own agenda and we cast our own future. But God has a different plan, bigger plan for every single one of us. He wants to shake our life, to strengthen us, to draw us closer to him and to teach us walking in faith and to teach us even things that we can't, we didn't even know exist. Even when God is speaking to us a lot of times directly, we still refuse to obey. All this time, we miss out on the reality that the Lord has it all under control. And he has a lot bigger plan for our present and future than we can ever, ever imagine. The beauty about all this is that God loves to take people along the way and bring them together, mending their hearts and to accomplish a lot for the kingdom of, for, for his kingdom. You see, I don't know about you, but if the Lord tells me something once, I'm going to listen. If he says to me something twice, I, he's definitely got my attention. If he says something three times, then I'm definitely dropping everything, stopping everything I'm doing. I'm getting on my knees and saying, Lord, here are my, use me or speak to me. Now, Peter here is very stubborn. He is stuck in his own way. He's, he doesn't want to go against tradition, but God is trying to push him out of his zone. Try, God's trying to unfaze God's trying to get him into a faith where he's unfazed. That's the whole point of God, to get him out of his comfort zone so that we teach him what God has in store for him. It's a lot different than what the flesh and the mental and the wisdom that we have sometimes guides us to be. In this story, we see the Cornelius sent out two. Then the two along the way became three people and somewhere along the way, the three became six and, and, and many and so forth. That's because God loves to take successful people and go on a journey and give them an opportunity to use their talents, to identify something special and to join in to make a difference. Smart, successful people become a part of something unique and special for the kingdom that is bigger than themselves because they see that there's no better value than eternal stock investment. I call it ROS, return on a soul, yes. They call the return on us all. And that is, that is the underlying way that here in our ministry amongst the Jews, amongst the Arabs, is we look at is what is it going to take to be able to reach one soul for the kingdom? What's the dollar amount? What's the sacrifice? How many persecution? How many cursing and cussing that we can get? How many sometimes the rocks thrown on us? How many beatings possibly? Or, or even what kind of miracle God's got installed to be able to, to get that ROS, to be able to get that soul or seeing that he or she needs a redeemer, needs a savior, and that savior, his name is Yeshua, Jesus Christ. You see, in previous verses, to come back to the scripture, in previous verses in this chapter, we see that Cornelius knows there is a supernatural experience with the appearance of this angel-like being, but doesn't know who or what it is. Therefore, we see Cornelius in this story. He calls this angel Lord, but when you read it in Greek, he calls him Lord with a lower L, which means Sir in Greek. Here, the angel tells Cornelius something that is very unique. He tells him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. I want to stop here for a second. I know I, I gave a summary about this in the beginning, but I tell people, let's ponder here. He's not a born again believer just yet. He has not received the water baptism or the first baptism of the Holy Spirit to self, through salvation. He's not a believer. He gave alms generously. He was generous. He prayed and still his prayers were heard. These traits the Lord noticed in Cornelius. The question is, where did he learn these traits? Well, from the unsaved Jew and the Jews in Caesarea. I tell people always, don't underestimate what God can do through you. Even if your faith is 1 out of 10, or even if your faith is 10 out of 10, don't underestimate what God can do. It doesn't matter if you are 
it doesn't matter where you're from around the world. It doesn't matter what's your race, what's your background. God can use you even through your struggles and your weaknesses. When others watch you, others see you, they'll, they'll, they'll be transformed or when they're, they'll be touched by your faith. When it's unfazed, even when you do feel weak as a human being. God used Peter to bring an awakening and a revival to Caesarea. God was teaching Peter something and he learned what God was trying to show him. We see that Peter, when he expresses this down the scriptures in verses 34, it says after God convicted him in verses 34. You see, it started off with, with Cornelius, God hearing his prayer. Then God appears in a vision and a dream in a trance to Peter and gets, tells Peter to eat from the basket of food. Peter struggles with God. And in the struggle with God, with Peter, God chastises Peter and wakes him up and says, Peter, that what he calls clean, don't call unclean. God's trying to push Peter out of his comfort zone so that he can create an unfazed faith in him and in his life and in the ministry. Peter gets the point. Because we see that in verses 34. He says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And we see in verses 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. We see two words in Hebrew and in Greek. Zeker mentioned. And of course, we also see anamnesos, which is to remember. And what here is saying is God is linking Cornelius with Peter. That God has heard the prayers and alms of Cornelius. And God has also now heard the prayers of Peter. And in, in the sense of pushing Cornelius to an unfazed faith and pushing Peter to have faith as unfazed, he pushed them together to the Lord and he pushed them together to meet each other. If Peter had refused to accept the calling of Christ in the vision to invite the Gentiles in, there's no tellings who or what or when the gospel would have come to you in your beloved land or to those even before you. What if there are some today in your household or in your city or in one of the forgotten villages and towns where, where many of you serve, where someone is praying, Lord, I don't know exactly everything about you, but I know you are real. And what if somebody's saying, Lord, if you're listening, would you reveal yourself to me? Send me someone to teach and to show me the truth. And the only thing standing in their way is you and me or others not surrendering to say, Lord, here am I, use me. What if it's our giving that's not, we're not giving enough, that's, that's not, that's hindering the expansion of the gospel? Or maybe us being afraid to love Jesus enough uh, out of fear that it would cause you or us to risk things for his name's sake. What if it's you're not giving enough when you could have done more, which ends up holding others back? If they would have had that much more blessing or support or resources or prayers, those that prayer and that given that resources could have transformed and could have changed the kingdom. If you are like a Cornelius or a Peter in the story scenario, you can make a difference with unfaced faith and determination to make a difference for the kingdom. You can be unfaced to also make a difference in your business and your daily life and even in your family. You can change your world. And you can impact the kingdom in ways you cannot even imagine. I want to share a quick story before we do the conclusion. I remember as I grew up in Israel, I mentioned I was born in Jerusalem. I grew up uh, in Bethlehem amongst the Palestinian communities, amongst the Arabs, Arab Christian and, and other Arabs and also the Jewish people. I've learned so many things about culture, about traditions, about faith, about religions and so forth. I've come to the conclusion on several things. One, the Bible is true. The Bible is real. Regardless of what people say, it's the truth. It transforms lives. Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection is real. It transforms life. It changes people. Blind faith, faith in Jesus, not being able to understand everything or explain everything, pushes you to have an unfazed faith. I remember in the last, let's say, just several years alone, 
There's so many stories to come to mind, but there's one specific story that comes to mind of a, of a man that came to us. He was searching for answers. I mean, this, this man, he was an Arab a person. He went to a Jewish rabbis. He went to people from other religions to sit down to talk to them about the Bible. And nobody could answer his questions. He had so many unique different questions about truth, about the scriptures, about the Bibles. And remember, he said, he told me, he said, I shouted, I said, Lord, if you are the God of the Bible, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? And he challenged the several religion gods out there. He ch- in, his, in his own closet, he challenged the gods of, of other religions. And he said, about 2 or 3 a.m. in that morning, he said, I woke up seeing a big white light in my room. And that white light looked like two fingers together as a cross. And he said he could not sleep. He shivered. He shook under the blanket. He said that experience of seeing this light in my room pushed me to a point to understand and to unequivocally be be 100% certain that Jesus Christ of the Bible is the answer and is the hope for mankind. He says he gave his life for Christ at that moment. And from then on, he began preaching and teaching the gospel. And today he's sharing the gospel throughout many other areas. We've, we've had the privilege to help grow his faith and to expand his faith into the into knowledge, into the scriptures. What if we did not bump into him? Can God send him somebody else? Yes, he, God could and God would. But why not us? Why not be you? Why not be me? Why not be us today to make a difference? But why not be able to say, Lord, here am I. Choose me. Use me to preach, teach, to give, to go, to make a difference in my life. And you know, another story comes to mind that I have written down here. It talks about sharing the gospel with others. Sharing the gospel with others and making a difference with other people's lives doesn't have to come at the price of conversion, at the price of attacking others, or, or even at the price of, of even showing somebody who's wrong, who's right. Sharing the message of the life of Jesus Christ with others, it's about being the light of the world. We've had so many people today come to us and they say, we, we are drawn to you simply because you have love and you have care and you have compassion for others. We are drawn to your ministry, drawn to your, to your movement. We are drawn to the message what you preach and teach in Hebrew and in Arabic because there's something different that draws us to it. And that's what we tell them. It's called the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. The Holy Spirit draws people who are hungry, who are broken, who need and who want to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ, who want hope. Today, people have no hope. And because of that need for hope, they are willing and open to search for things that are different. And, you know, in my childhood growing up in the Holy Land, I've always had that one vision, one dream is to preach and to teach the gospel in pockets and cities and villages and towns in homes throughout the country. And I'm telling you today, I'm so honored, so humbled to be able to do this on a, almost a weekly basis. We're going to villages and towns or homes and people's homes, sitting down with them, seeing miracles, preaching, teaching, seeing salvation, seeing people faith shook to a point where they go back and they relearn their Bible or they go back and rethink who they are or they rethink their religion or where they came from. Why? Because the power of Christ and the message of Christ and the, and the cross of Christ, it has power to transform people, has a power to transform lives globally. And that is regardless of who they are or who you are, where you're from, where you're living, where you're standing, that there's power in the cross and there's power to change people's lives. And that's very very encouraging and very important. And I say this because of this. It's because as I grew up here in Israel, the Holy Land, as I watched around, people have changed and times have gone and come. Technology has changed. What I've learned to realize is people is about relationship. And that is so important. Relationship is crucial. And that's what Peter and Cornelius needed together. Bible says that Peter went to Caesarea and he walked towards Cornelius, Bible says Cornelius came and he knelt at the feet of Peter. And what does Cornelius tell Peter? He says, Peter, the Lord has shown me who you are. The Lord has shown me that you're a man of God. And Cornelius tells Peter, it's my honor for you to be here. Cornelius picks him up and says, don't bow before me because I'm only a mere man just like you. Bible says that Peter walks into Cornelius' home, which again goes against Jewish traditions. But now... He's unfazed. He's changed. He's pushed to the limit. He's pushed out of, pushed out of his comfort zone. Peter walks into the house of Cornelius and Peter begins his sentence. He says to people this, he says, as you know, I am a Jew. As a Jew, I'm not allowed to, I am not, I am not supposed to be in the home of a Gentile, nor am I supposed to sit at the meal of a Gentile. 
But Peter understood that it takes relationship, it takes love, humility, and compassion, which all comes by making a, having a choice and making a choice of being unfazed. He looks at him and he says, you all know that I'm not supposed to be here. God has taught me that what God gives us, we must take and we, we, we must run with it. We must move forward with whatever God gives us. We must make a difference with as a tool in our hands or abilities to be able to make a difference. Bible says that Peter preached an amazing message. And Cornelius, his friends, his brothers, his family, his neighbors, his household. Bible says they all became believers and they got baptized right then and there. You know what's so amazing is we see down the line, down the road, that the Cornelius started the church, which actually ended up having a ripple effect throughout much part of the northern part of Israel, even the north part of the Holy Land. All because of a man known Cornelius, who was willing to say, Lord, give me faith that's unfazed. And because of Peter, who was willing, at the, after three times, was willing to say, Lord, use me. And Lord, I will do what you desire. Lord, I am yours. I'm your servant. And because of these two, two, two things together, we saw a church established. We saw the house of Cornelius saved. We, Peter's ministry changed. If you start to read further throughout scriptures and Acts, we, this Peter's, Peter had a dynamic change in his faith, in his ministry, his preaching, his teaching, simply because of Cornelius. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the church that was started in the north in Caesarea and Joppa, which spread throughout the Holy Land and throughout uh, the, the islands at that time. There's no imagination that's too small or too big for God. What we need to do is to be willing to say, Lord, here we are, use us. That's what we've done in the last 40 plus years. And that's what we're doing today. We're excited here in Israel that we have, God's given us a great vision for the next five to 10 years. And this vision has to do with planning more churches, sending out more evangelists, to creating more outreach centers and more outreach programs, be able to build, create that connection between the Arab and the Jew, between Christians and other religions in this country. All in the focus and in the hope to be able to show and to share the light of Jesus. Here's one my question to you. Would you partner with us as we share the love of Jesus to the Arab and to the Jew, as we share with them the gospel message and of the work of Christ on the cross? We invite you to come alongside of us to make a difference. If you face Jesus face to face today, I want to ask you this question, a personal heart to heart question. If you face Jesus today face to face, and he grabbed you by your lapel, by your shirt, and just pulled you within a few inches to your face. If the Lord were to ask you, my son, what have you done for me that's worth anything in heaven? What would you say? What would your response be to Jesus today? I know for me, I would say, Lord, please give me just another 24 hours, Lord. Give me just another 24 hours to live for you, to, to make a difference for you. Another 24 hours to say, Lord, just let me preach the gospel one more time. Let me love others more. Let me ask for forgiveness from others. Lord, let me give more and give all I can so that I can ensure the gospel is being spread around Israel, the Middle East, and around the world. Would you right now open your heart and mind to the voice and to the leading of the Holy Spirit? What you just heard is coming to you from the Holy Land. It's coming to you from Israel. What you heard is a mix of my life story of seeing persecution and suffering, standing strong and being beaten and attacked and monotop bombs and fire bombs, but still getting up every morning, every day, unfazed, even when it's tired, even though we get hard, even sometimes when it feels like we're broken. But we get up because we know that God's got a plan. God sees ahead. He knows what's the hidden. He knows the hidden. He knows what's revealed. Because of that, we get up every morning. We say, Lord, we're moving forward. And, and, and of course, the voice I represent now, it's the voice of many others who have paid a price, who have suffered for the kingdom of Christ. And they've suffered because they see the bigger picture. That God's got it all under control. God has got a plan for them, even when they not be able, might not be able to explain it or rationalize it, even justify it. But God's got a plan. But that's what unfazed faith is all about. That's why I love the theme for missions unfazed. I love the theme for this conference that your church leadership has chosen. It's beautiful. It's so fitting, especially in the time we're in right now with, with COVID and, and with so much change in this world and the business world, the corporate world, the, the health world and social world and social justice world and so much changes. As long as our faith is on faith, as long as our relationship with Jesus is on faith, that's all that matters because at the end, that's all that is going to matter. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Would you allow what you've heard today to just to sink in? 
and just to allow what you've heard today from your brother in, in the Holy Land. Would you allow it to touch you, to push your faith, to make you stronger today? Would you right now, just as you get your hearts ready for the altar call, would you just take a second right now to say, Lord, use me. Lord, what do you want to speak to me? What do you want to tell me, Lord, in these difficult, uncertain times? Would you say, Lord, push me to have unfazed faith? Would you do that? As right now the service leader comes to lead you, I challenge you to take a step of faith. I challenge you to get up out of your seat and to go to the front altar. And so, Lord, I want to have stronger, deeper relationship with you. That's all Jesus wants. He wants a deeper relationship, an intimate relationship with you. And you know what? There are hundreds and hundreds and thousands like that right here in the Holy Land, in the place where our faith began. Allow us and help us be the Peters to the Corneliuses in Israel. And I pray that you be a Peter to the Corneliuses in those around you in your beloved land. Shalom and salam, and God bless you. Amen. Amen. Even as Pastor Curry said, let's take some time to let what he has just shared sink in. Let the Holy Spirit do a prompting in you. Let the Holy, give the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit permission to search you, to prompt you, to open up your eyes, physical or spiritual. Next, Jen, I don't know whether you caught what he said. God has a bigger plan for each and every one of us, each and every one of you. And he doesn't just have that big plan. He's also taking us along the way. He's guiding each and every one of us along the way. And all these individual plans that he has for all of you seated here, seated in battle, online, it comes into alignment with the plan that he has for the world. As difficult as it may sound, as difficult it may seem to hear from this week, you know, because of the state of current affairs, we, we keep seeing that verse from Matthew 24, that we will hear of wars and rumours of wars, that kingdoms will rise against kingdoms and sinfulness will be rampant. But verse 13 and 14 says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come the one who stands firm, the one who is unfazed, the one who may be exhausted but inspired, the one who may be heartbroken but still hopeful. Is that you today? I want to pray for some of us right now Maybe some of you, you desire, you hear from pastor, you want that unfazed faith that you have, that he has. And you want to be like him. You want to be drawn into a deeper intimacy and a stronger relationship with Jesus. If that is you, I'm going to invite you to raise your hands right now so that I can pray for you. You can raise your hands to the Lord. I see that hand. Thank you for your hands. You are raising your hands to the Lord. You are raising your hands to the Lord as an invitation for Him to take that step, for Him to draw you closer. Thank you for your hands. The second group of us are those who want to also live an unfazed life because you want to, you are willing, you're telling God right now as you, not just as you heard from the sermon, but as you watch the news as you scroll through social media, you tell God, God, use me. Use me in any way possible. Use me in the ways that I know. Use me in the ways that I don't know. Use me to reach those who need you. I don't, you don't even need to go overseas. Reach the ones who are in your lives already, in your schools, in your jobs, in your army camps. Reach those. Just like how Peter reached out to Cornelius. And so if you are willing to make that difference today, and you may have raised your hand before, and maybe you feel like, I, 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 I don't want to raise it. 
I want to challenge you to raise it again. I want you to challenge, I want to challenge you to raise it to the Lord because I trust that the Lord will indeed move, that the Lord will indeed give you opportunities, that the Lord will indeed lead you into paths so that your life is a testimony of being unfazed. So if that is you, I'm also going to encourage you to lift up your hands right now. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Remember that you are lifting up your hands to the Lord, not anyone else, but to the Lord. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for your hands. Next gen, shall we stand? Let's stand as I get the worship team to minister to us. If you have raised your hand at, at any point in time, commit that to the Lord before we pray. And if you were not in any of the groups that responded, still respond to the Lord for what He's doing in the world. Respond. Praise the Lord. Ask Him to show you what He's doing. Ask Him to give you understanding. Ask Him to give you perspective. Let's worship the Lord. Splendor of a King He's clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice
Jesus. All we are is yours, Lord. Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters who have responded, who have responded to your prompting, who have responded to your call. Father, would you seal that word in their hearts, seal that word in their spirit, man and woman, oh God. And Father, would you do what needs to be done to raise it up. Father, would you do what needs to be done that, that they have bravery, that they have courage to walk down these paths, to see these opportunities, to mock this them by, oh God. Give them that faith to step forth into these journeys with you, oh God, because we want to remain Unfaced. We want to stand firm. We want to stand firm even as everything around us changes, even as we don't recognize things, even as we are uncertain. We want to remain firm because you are our firm foundation. You are our Lord. You are our unchanging God. So, Father, for those of next gen who have responded, work in them, Lord. Do whatever it takes. And may they give you that space and may their hands and their feet move in alignment and obedience to you as well. So we commit next gen into your hands. We thank you. We thank you for the message from your servant. We thank you for the seeds that have been planted. We thank you for the decisions that have been made today, oh God. May we live worthy of that call that you have called each and every one of us, each and every one of us to. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why don't we give the Lord a clap offering next gen? The Lord has really done something.